In 1793, the streets of Paris were awash in blood. Nowhere in the city was safe for the old aristocratic families of France. Their ancestors had oppressed the people, had crushed them under the scarlet heels of their dainty buckled shoes. And now the people had become the rulers of France and crushed their former masters. But not beneath their heel, for they went shoeless mostly in these days, but beneath a more effectual weight, the knife of the guillotine. For two hundred years now, the people had sweated and toiled and starved to keep a lustful court in lavish extravagance. Now the descendants of those debauched nobles had to fly for their lives if they wished to avoid the tardy vengeance of the people. And they did try to fly. Every afternoon before the city gates closed and the market carts went out in procession, some fool endeavored to evade the clutches of the Committee of Public Safety. For these desperate attempts were nothing more than an amusing diversion for the agents of the Republic, for the escape artists were always caught at the barricades and brought back, stripped of their disguises, to await the guillotine. Uh, that is, until the Scarlet Pimpernel appeared in Paris. In September of 1793, an alarming number of aristocrats managed to evade the watchful eyes of the city guards. Rumor had it that these escapes were organized by a band of Englishmen who, from sheer desire to meddle in what did not concern them, spent their spare time in snatching away lawful victims destined for Madame la Guillotine. No one had seen these mysterious Englishmen. As for their leader, he was never spoken of save with a superstitious shudder. The chief public prosecutor would, in the course of the day, receive a scrap of paper from some mysterious source. Sometimes he would find it in the pocket of his coat. At others, it would be handed to him by someone in the crowd. The paper always contained a brief notice that the band of meddlesome Englishmen were at work, and it was always signed with a symbol printed in red wax from a signet ring, a little star-shaped flower which the English call the Scarlet Pimpernel. Within a few hours of receiving this impudent notice, the citoyens of this Committee of Public Safety would hear that so many royalists and aristocrats had succeeded in reaching the coast and were on their way to safety in England. Even hundreds of years later, the true name of the mysterious Scarlet Pimpernel has never been discovered until now. After years of exhaustive research and compiling countless letters, diaries, and documents from the reign of terror, I believe I have discovered the true identity of this legendary vigilante. I have compiled those many sources into tonight's dramatic reenactment, featuring a cast of local actors and Pimpernel theorists. But without further ado, I am happy to present the true tale of the Scarlet Pimpernel. From the papers of Suzanne de Tournay, the private journal of Marguerite Saint-Just Blakeney, and the account books of Mr. Jellyband, proprietor of the Fisherman's Rest Inn in Dover. What? Oh, Sally. Lord bless my soul, what are they all wanting now? What? Oh, Sally, are you going to be all night with that beer? You know how busy we are in the kitchen, Father. I thought you'd grown deaf in that kitchen of yours. Did you ever see such a wet September, Mr. Jellyband? It do seem more like April than September, don't it? Only fruit rotting and drying. Well, as the scriptures say... That's quite right, Mr. Hempseed, but what can you expect with the way the world's gone? Frenchy devils over the channel murdering their king, and the Whigs and Tories in Parliament are fighting and are wrangling between them? Let her murder, says the Tories. Stop them, says the Whigs. And nobody does anything. Let her murder, says I, and be damned to them. Let her murder, but don't let there not be such rain in September. Yeah. Now then, Sally, me girl. Stop then. Stop fooling around and get on with the work. The work's getting on all right, father. The fisherman's rest will be yours one day, and then you can sit about with your feet up. Until then, get on with Lord Tony's supper. Expecting special guests then tonight, Mr. Jellyband? Aye, that I be. Fancy folk from over the water, who young Lord Tony and his friends rescued from them murdering devils. Well, what they do that for, I wonder. 
I don't hold with interfering in other folks' ways, as the scriptures say. Maybe. Uh, Mr. Hempseed, you could sit in Parliament with the Tories saying, let him murder. Pardon me, Mr. Jellybend, I don't know as I ever said that. He did. He said, let him murder, but let it not rain in September. Dinner, Sally. All I know like, is that you sound like my friend Peppercorn, who owns the blue-faced boar. He made friends with some of them frog eaters, and what happened? Now he ups and talks about revolutions and liberties and down with aristocrats, just like Mr. MC did here. Pardon me, Mr. Jellyband. I don't know as I ever said that. Uh, you seem to think, mine honest friend, that these Frenchmen are mighty clever fellows to have made mincemeat of your friend Mr. Peppercorn's opinions. How did they accomplish that now, think you? Well, I suppose they talked him over. I've heard it said that those Frenchies have got the gift of gab, and Mr. Hempseed will tell you how it is. Indeed. And is that so, Mr. Hempseed? I don't know as I can give you information on that. But then let us hope, my worthy host, that these clever spies will not succeed in upsetting your extremely loyal opinions. <laughs> I got that. Well, Mr. Jellyband, you know what the scriptures say. Let him who stands take heed, lest he fall. Hark, Mr. Hemseed, the scriptures didn't know me. Why, I wouldn't drink so much as a glass of ale with one of them murdering Frenchmen. And I hear they can't even speak the king's English, so of course I could spot one directly. Oh, yes, mine honest friend. I see that you are much too sharp for any Frenchman, and here's to your very good health, my worthy host, if you'll do me the honor to finish this bottle of wine with me. Don't mind if I do. Loyal Englishmen as we all are, we must admit that wine is at least one good thing which comes to us from France. Ah, uh, I well, none of us that deny that, sir. And here's to the best landlord in England, our worthy host, Mr. Jellyband. Hip, hip, hurrah! Oh, just fancy me being talked over by any godforsaken ferner. I think I see Lord Tony's horse out in the yard, father. How do you do, Miss Sally? You're growing prettier every time I see you. And my honest friend, Mr. Jellyband, always a pleasure. Well, Mr. Hempseed, and how is the fruit? Badly, my lord, badly. What can you expect with this, your government supporting the rascals over in France? So they would, at least those they can get hold of. But we have got some friends coming here tonight who have managed to evade their clutches. Well, thanks to you, my lord, and to your friends, so I've heard said. Ah, uh, hush, there are strangers here. Oh, don't you be afraid. They are all right, my lord. That gentleman over there is as true and loyal a subject of King George as you yourself, my lord. Oh, that's that's all right then, if we are among friends. Um, but tell me, you have no one else staying here, have you? No one, my lord, and no one coming either. Leastways, no one your lordship would object to. Who is it? Well, my lord... Sir Percy Blakeney and his lady will be here presently, but they ain't staying long. Lady Blakeney? Aye, my lord. Lady Blakeney's brother is coming crossing over to France today in the daydream. You know, for Sir Percy's boat, and they will come with him as far as here, if they don't put you out, my lord. Uh, no, no, nothing will put me out, unless that supper is not the very best which Miss Sally can cook. Need have no fear of that. I've made all of your favourites. How many shall I lay for, uh, for, my lord? Five places, Sally, but let the supper be enough for eight at least. Our friends will be tired and, I hope, hungry. As for me, I vow I could demolish a baron of beef tonight. Here they are, I do believe. Oh, and so they are. Now, my dear Sally, let's see how quickly you can dish up the soup. Well now, welcome to jolly old England. Uh, uh, you are Lord Anthony Duarst, I think. At your service, madam. Please, call me Tony. Uh, monsieur, what, what can I say? Only that you are glad to be in England, Comtesse, and that you have not suffered too much from your trying voyage. 
Uh, in, indeed, indeed, we are glad to be in England. We have already forgotten all that we have suffered. <laughs> I, I hope my friend Sir Andrew Folks proved an entertaining traveling companion, madam. <laughs> Sir Andrew was kindness itself. Ah, <laughs> uh, so this is England at last. Uh, a bit of it, mademoiselle, but all that at your service. What? I say, supper. Supper, honest jolly band. Where is that pretty wench of yours with, with her famous soup? Ready, sir. Thank heavens. And may I have the honor of escorting you to dinner, Madame de Tournay? Uh, Suzanne, supper. Yes, Mama. Good night, Mr. Jellyband. Ah, good. Alone at last. To His Majesty George III of England. God bless him for his hospitality to us all, poor exiles from France. His Majesty, the king. The king. and to the Comtesse de Tournay, may we welcome him to England before many days are over. Uh, monsieur, I, I scarcely dare to hope. Oh, mine was no uh, idle toast, madam. Seeing yourself and your children safely in England, surely you must feel reassured as to the fate of your husband. Oh, monsieur? I can but pray for his safety. Trust in God by all means, madam, but believe also a little in your English friends. In, indeed, indeed, monsieur, I have nothing but the fullest confidence in you and in your friends. Uh, your fame, I assure you, has spread throughout the whole of France. But my husband, monsieur, he is in such deadly peril. He gave them our home, he gave them all our money, but they sentenced him to death because he would not give them information. I would never have left them, only my children refused to go without me. But now that I am here amongst you all, I think of him flying for his life, hunted like a poor beast, should not have left him. Mama, no, don't say such a thing. As for me, monsieur, I trust you absolutely. I know that you will soon bring my dear father safely to England. You shame me, mademoiselle. Though my life is at your service, I have been but a humble tool in the hands of our leader, who is the true mastermind behind your escape. But tell me, where is he? I must go to him at once and, and throw myself at his feet and thank him for all he has done for my family. Uh, alas, madam, that is impossible. The Scarlet Pimpernel works in the dark, and his identity is only known under a solemn oath of secrecy to his followers. The, the Scarlet Pimpernel? <laughs> Why, what a funny name! The Scarlet Pimpernel, mademoiselle, is but the name of a humble English wayside flower, but it is also the name chosen to hide the identity of the bravest man in England. Ah, uh, yes, I have heard of this scarlet uh, pimpermill, a, a little flower, red, yes? They say in Paris that every time someone escapes to England, that devil, the public prosecutor, receives a paper with that little flower designated in red upon it. Oui? Yes, that is so, and... May he have many more opportunities to study the shape of that flower. Ah, uh, monsieur, it all sounds like a, a romance. But tell me, why should your leader or any of you spend your money and risk your lives all for us French men and women who are nothing to you? Oh, sport, Madame La Comtesse, sport. We are a nation of sportsmen, you know, and just now it is the fashion to pull the hair from between the teeth of the hound. Tally-ho, and away we go! How many are there in your brave league, monsieur? Uh, Twenty, all told. One to command and nineteen to obey. All of us Englishmen and all of us pledged to the same cause. To rescue the innocent by any means. God protect you all, monsieur. He has done that so far. It is... Wonderful to me, wonderful that you should all be so devoted to your fellow men. The men in France are so treacherous. There's women in France, too. Ah, yes. There was 
that woman, Marguerite Saint-Just, she denounced the Marquis de Saint-Cyr and his whole family to the awful tribunal. His wife and children killed too. Marguerite Saint-Just, surely. Surely you've heard of her. She was a leading actress of the Comédie Française. And she married an Englishman not long ago. Uh, you must know her. Know her? <laughs> the most fashionable woman in London? Of course we all know Lady Blakeney. She was a schoolfellow of mine at the convent in Paris. I will not believe she ever did anything so wicked. It certainly seems incredible. You say she personally denounced the Marquis de saint -Cyr? Well, surely there must be some mistake. No mistake is possible, monsieur. Marguerite Saint-Just's brother is a noted Republican. There was some talk of a feud between him and my cousin, the Marquis de Saint-Cyr. You had not heard this story? Uh, Faith, madam, I did hear some vague rumours of it, but no one in England would credit it. Her husband, Sir Percy Blakeney, is an absurdly wealthy baronet, the immediate friend of the Prince of Wales. And Lady Blakeney leads both fashion and society in London, hardly the picture of a bloodthirsty Jacobin. That may be, monsieur. And we shall, of course, lead a very quiet life in England. But I pray that while I remain in this beautiful country, I may never meet Marguerite Saint-Just. Jellyman, <laughs> at what time do you expect Sir Percy and Lady Blakeney? Any moment, my lord. Lord love me. Uh, Percy Blakeney and my lady, they're just arriving. Oh, Lord, love me. Uh, for God's sake, man, uh, try to keep Lady Blakeney talking outside for a moment while, uh, while the ladies withdraw. The candles, Sally, the candles. I will not see her. I will not see her. Uh, yeah, good day, Sir Percy. Uh, good day to your ladyship. Your servant, Sir Percy. <laughs> yeah. I say I'm frozen to the bone. Has anyone ever seen such a contemptible climate? Suzanne? Come with me at once. Oh, Mama. My um, lady, uh, uh, my lady. Pardon me, my good man. Might I get closer to the fire? I'm perished with the cold. Lord Tony, what would you be doing here in Dover of all places? What if that isn't my little Suzanne over there? Suzanne, I forbid you to speak to that woman. Goodness, whatever is the matter. We are in England now, madame. I am at liberty to do as I please. Come, Suzanne. So that's it, is it? Sir Andrew, did you ever see such an unpleasant person? I hope when I grow old, I don't look like that. I forbid you to speak to that woman. Ah, uh, Lady Blakeney, how they must miss you at the Comédie Française. Uh, and how the Parisians must hate Sir Percy for having taken you away. Well, it is impossible to hate Sir Percy for anything. His wit would disarm even Madame la Comtesse herself. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Sir Percy Blakeney. As the chronicles of the time inform us, it was nearly a year ago now that young Sir Percy had astonished by bringing home from one of his journeys abroad a beautiful, fascinating, clever French wife. He, the sleepiest, dullest, most British Britisher that had ever set up, had secured a brilliant matrimonial prize for which, as all chroniclers aver, there had been many competitors. Marguerite Saint-Just had first made her debut in artistic Parisian circles just as the greatest social upheaval the world has ever known was taking place. She was from principle and by conviction a Republican. Inequality of fortune was in her eyes a mere untoward accident. But the only inequality she admitted was that of talent. Money and titles may be hereditary, but brains are not. And thus, her charming salon was reserved for brilliance and wit. And she glided through revolutionary, revolutionary Paris like a shining comet with a trail behind her of all that was most distinguished most interesting in Europe. How oh, that stupid Englishman ever came to be admitted within the intellectual circle, no one ventured to guess. A golden key is said to open every door, asserted the more 
malignantly inclined. <laughs> How do you do, Tony? How do, folks? Zoon, my dear fellow, have you ever seen such a beastly day? Oh, sink me, how sheepish you all look. What's up? Oh, nothing, Sir Percy. Nothing to disturb your equanimity. Only an insult to your wife. Oh, be gad. It was the bold man who dared to tackle you. Monsieur, my mother, the Comtesse de Tournay, has offensed Madame, who I see as your wife. I cannot ask for your pardon for my mother. What she does is right in my eyes. But I am ready to offer you the usual reparation between men of honor. Look, Sir Andrew, on that pretty picture, the English turkey and the French bantam. Law, sir, where in the cuckoo's name did you learn to speak English? I protest, it's marvelous. Damned marvelous. Don't you think so, Tony? Monsieur, I fear you have not understand. I offer you the only possible reparation among gentlemen. Where the devil is that? My sword, monsieur. Oh, Lord, love you, young man. What's the good of your sword to me? I've already got one. <laughs> A duel, monsieur. Oh, odd fish. Do you want to make a hole in Lord Biting Man's new waistcoat? As for me, sir, I never fight duels. Damned and comfortable things, duels. Ain't they, Tony? Oh, Percy, can't you be serious for once in your life? Afraid not, my dear. I simply, simply never got the knack for it. Please, Lord Tony, play the peacemaker between them. The child is bursting with rage and might do Sir Percy an injury. <laughs> Sir Percy would provoke all the saints in the calendar and keep his temper all the while. Yes, yeah, a clever woman, my wife, sir. You'll find out that out if you live long enough in England. Uh, please, please uh, Vicomte, uh, it would hardly be fitting that you should uh, commence your career in England by provoking a duel. Ah, uh, well, if monsieur is satisfied, <laughs> I have no griefs. You, my lord, are our protector. If I have done wrong, I withdraw myself. <laughs> withdraw yourself of, of, over there, young man. Hmm. Oh, damned excitable little puppy. Oh, faith, folks, if that's the specimen of goods you bring over from France, my advice to you is to drop the mid-channel. <laughs> Percy, you forget that you yourself have imported one bundle of goods from France. What, my maroon velvet bridges? Your wife? No, I had the pick of the market, madame, and my, my taste is unerring. More so than your chivalry, I fear. No, what's life, my dear? Be reasonable. Do you think I'm going to allow my body to be made the pincushion of every little frog eater who you don't like the shape of your nose? You need not be afraid, Sir Percy. It is not the men who dislike the shape of my nose. <laughs> so folks, mark you that. I have made my wife laugh, the cleverest woman in Europe. We must have a bell on that. Here, Jenny, the wits that have just made the clever woman laugh must be waited. There is no time, Sir Percy. The skipper will be here directly, and my brother must get on board, or the daydream will miss her tide. Time, my dear? There's plenty of time for any gentleman to get drunk and get on board before the turn of the tide. And your dear brother Armand can, can join us in Erebo, eh? In fact, you are all such merry company that I trust you'll forgive me if I bid my brother goodbye in another room. Mm -hmm. Outside the inn, as recorded in the private diary of Marguerite Saint-Just Blakeney and the captain's log of the daydream, translated from the French. You are, Armand. How much time have we got before you need to get on board? About half an hour. Just an hour? I can't believe that you're going already. These last few days with you while Percy has been away have slipped by like a dream. I'm not going far, Margot. A narrow channel to cross, a few miles of road. I can soon come back. You know perfectly well it is not the distance that troubles me. Her own beautiful country, Margot. They are going too far. It's not just royals and royalists who are condemned now. Even other Jacobins are being persecuted. I once believed the Republic was ruled by the people, and now I fear it's ruled by the police. 
you are a Republican and so am I. We have the same beliefs, the same hunger for justice, but even you must think that it's not right. You see, you don't even think it's safe to say these things here in England. Please, Armand, don't go back. What should I do if, if you... You would, in any case, be my own brave sister, who would remember that when France is in peril, it is not for her sons to turn their backs on her. You know, I do sometimes wish you had not so many lofty virtues. I assure you, little sins are far less dangerous and uncomfortable. But you will be prudent. As far as possible. Forgive me for worrying, but you're the only family I have now. You have a new family of your own, my dear Margot. Whatever happens to me, you will have Percy to care for you. Care for me? <laughs> he did once. But, but surely... There, there, dear. And don't distress yourself on my account. Percy is very good. And... I'll distress myself on your account if I bloody want to. You see, you're speaking like an Englishman already. Please, just listen to me. I have not spoken of these things to you before. Something always seemed to stop me when I wished to question you, but somehow I feel as if I could not go away and leave you now without asking you one question. What is it? Does Sir Percy know the part you played in the arrest of the Marquis de saint -Cyr? I confess I was not expecting that question. I was dreading the prospect of discussing my marriage bed with my little brother, and now that would seem to be the more palatable option. You mean, does he know that I denounced the Marquis de Saint-Cyr to the tribunal that sent him and all his family to the guillotine? Yes, he does know. I told him after I married him. You told him all the circumstances, surely, about Angèle. About how the Marquis had you thrashed within an inch of your life for daring to send a love poem to his daughter about how he's the reason your poor leg will never be the same? No. It was too late to talk of circumstances. He had heard the story from other sources. My confession came too tardily, it seems. How could I demean myself by trying to explain? And then what happened? And now... I have the satisfaction, Armand, of knowing that the biggest fool in England has the most complete contempt for his wife. But Sir Percy loved you. Loved me? Well, I thought at one time that he did, or I should not have married him. I dare say that even you thought that I married Sir Percy because of his wealth, but I assure you that it was not so. I seem to worship me with a curious intensity of passion. No, complete and utter concentration, which went straight to my heart. I had never loved anyone before, as you know, and I was nearly four and twenty then, so I naturally thought it was not in my nature to love. But it has always seemed to me that it must be heavenly to be loved blindly, passionately, wholly. Worship, in fact. The very fact that Percy was slow and stupid was an attraction for me, because I thought he would love me all the more. A clever man would naturally have other interests, an ambitious man, other hopes. I thought that a fool, a fool would worship, think of nothing else. You were young, misguided, ill-advised, perhaps. Your reasons, you know, Sir Percy Armand. Does he seem to you the kind of man on whom reason would produce the faintest impression? He may surprise you. Please, talk to your husband. There must be a part of you that truly does love him or you wouldn't be afraid of what he'd say. Don't deprive your sister of the pleasure of holding on to a few secrets, Armand. I have so few pleasures these days. And I know you have secrets of your own. What do you mean? Do you think I'm as dull as the man that I married? I've known you since you were born. I can tell there's something different about you. You don't laugh as you used to. You get 
strange letters at all times of the night. Don't tell me that you've fallen in love with another woman back in Paris. So soon after Angèle, you're risking your life to see a woman. <laughs> no, no, of course not. <laughs> I thought I specifically told you not to tell me. You can keep your secrets of the heart and I'll keep mine. Don't let me spoil these last few moments with you by speaking about myself. Let's go to the dock and watch the boats and try not to be too clever. Just like old times. Yes. Marguerite and Armand were not alone on the cliffs outside the fisherman's rest. As Lady Blakeney bid her brother bon voyage, a figure watched from the shadows. Allow me to introduce Agent Chauvelin of the Committee of Public Safety. But then you've already met. He was the stranger who chatted with Mr. Jellyband over a bottle of French wine. Citoyen Saint Just. Yeah. <laughs> Himself, Citoyen, at your service. Oh, my old friend. I can't tell you how pleased I am to see you. How I miss our little circle back in Paris. But tell me, what in the world, or who in the world, are you doing in England? <laughs> oh, I might return the compliment, my dear lady. What of yourself? Oh, I, je m'en lis, mon ami, that is all. You surprise me, citoyen. I thought you should find it impossible to be bored anywhere. Now, now, my little Chauvelin. I should have thought you would have guessed that an atmosphere of fog and virtues would never suit Marguerite Saint-Just. Dear me. Is it really as bad as that? Worse. You'll hardly believe it, my little Chauvelin, but I often pass an entire day, a whole day, without encountering a single temptation. Oh. No wonder that the cleverest woman in Europe is troubled with ennui. It must be pretty bad, mustn't it? Otherwise, I shouldn't have been so happy to see you. And this within a year of the whirlwind romance of the century. Mm. Then that idyllic folly did not survive the lapse of weeks. Idyllic follies never last. They come upon us like the measles and are as easily cured. <sighs> was in hopes that you had a prescription against the malady, my little Chauvelin. Oh, well, how can I hope to succeed in that which the wonderful Sir Percy Blakeney has failed to accomplish? Shall we leave Sir Percy out of the question for the present? <laughs> Alas, I have a most perfect prescription against the worst form of ennui, which I would have been happy to submit to you, but... But what? There is Sir Percy. What is he to do with it? Quite a good deal, I'm afraid. The prescription I would offer goes by a very plebeian name. Work. Work? <laughs> there I ask where you're leading me. Will you render France a small service, citoyen? How serious you look all of a sudden. Indeed, I do not know if I would render France any kind of service at all. I suppose it depends upon the kind of service that she or you want. Have you ever heard of the Scarlet Pimpernel? Heard of the Scarlet Pimpernel? We talk of nothing else here in England. We have hats a la Scarlet Pimpernel. Our horses are called the Scarlet Pimpernel. At the Prince of Wales' supper party the other night, we had souffle a la Scarlet Pimpernel. Mon Dieu, the other day, I ordered at my milliner's a blue dress trimmed with green, and bless me if she did not call that a la Scarlet Pimpernel. There wasn't a bit of scarlet on it. <laughs> uh, then, as you have heard of that enigmatical personage, you must also know that the man behind that strange pseudonym is the most bitter enemy of our Republic. France does seem to have so many bitter enemies these days, you'd think they'd run out of heads to chop. But you, citoyen, are a daughter of France, and should be ready to help her in a moment of deadly peril. My brother Armand devotes his life to France. I'm afraid you just missed him. As for me, I can do nothing here in England. Oh, yes, 
Here in England, you alone can help us. I've been sent over here by the Republican government as its representative. One of my duties here is to find out all about this League of the Scarlet Pimpernel, which has become a standing menace to France. You know as well as I do that once they're over here, those French emigres try to rouse public feeling against the Republic. And now within the last month, scores of these emigres, some only suspected of treason, others actually condemned by the tribunal, have succeeded in crossing the channel. Their escape in each instance was planned, organized, and affected by this society of young English jackanapes. All the most strenuous efforts on the parts of my spies have failed to discover who their leader is. Whilst the others are the petals, he is the stem from which the destruction of France slowly grows. I mean to sever that stem, and for this I want your help. Find that man for me, Marguerite. Find him for France. Goodness. <laughs> you really are as astonishing as ever. And where in the world would I look for him? Oh, Lady Blakeney is the pivot of social London, or so I'm told. You go everywhere, you see everything, you hear everything. The perfect agent. Easy, my friend, easy. You seem to forget that there are well over six feet of Sir Percy Blakeney and a long line of ancestors that stand between Lady Blakeney and such a thing as you suggest. For the sake of France, citoyenne! And even if you did know who this Scarlet Pimpernel is, you could do nothing to him. Even your Committee of Public Safety has no power over English citizens. <laughs> Oh, I'd take my chance. We could send him to the guillotine first to get him off our hands. Then when there's a diplomatic fuss about it, we can apologize humbly to the British government and if necessary, pay compensation to the bereaved family. Wouldn't be the first time. What you propose is horrible, Chauvin. What could have possessed you to think that I would be your agent in this? I would never, do you hear me? Never lend a hand to such villainy. Oh, then you prefer to be insulted by every French aristocrat who comes to this country? I can defend myself, but I refuse to do any dirty work for you or for France. You have other means at your disposal. You must use them. That is not your last word, citoyen. We meet in London, I hope. We may meet in London, but that is my last word. Oh, we shall see, Marguerite. We shall see. <sighs> From the records of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel, the account books of Mr. Jellyband, and the official files of the Committee of Public Safety. I say, Jerry, has everyone gone? And all your servants gone to bed? Everyone, as you see, my lord. Then we can talk here undisturbed for half an hour. At your service, my lord. I'm going up to bed, but if your lordship will on the call loudly enough, I dare say I shall hear. Splendid, Jerry. And I say, uh, put the lamp out. The fire will give us enough, uh, all the light we need, and uh, we don't want to attract the passers-by. All right, my lord. Night, Jerry. Thank you. Everything all right this time, folks? Uh, yes, yes. No hitch? No. I uh, need not ask, I suppose, whether you found the journey pleasant this time? No, friend, you need not ask. It was all right. Then here's to her very good health. She's a bonnie lass, though she is a French one. Well, you'll be doing the journey next, I expect. And I hope you may have as pleasant a task as I had, and was charming a traveling companion. You've no idea, Tony. No, no, I, I haven't, but I'll take your word for it. And now, how about we get down to brass tacks? Yes, let's. I saw the Scarlet Pimpernel in Calais a day or two ago. He had escorted the Detonés all the way from Paris, dressed, if you can believe it, as an old market woman, all in a shawl and petticoat and a bonnet. 
and he was driving an old tubbard cart under which the de Tournay family lay concealed among the turnips and the cabbages. And they themselves, of course, never suspected who their driver was. <laughs> hey, that man's a marvel. That he is. Well, he wants you and George Hastings to meet him at Calais on the 2nd of next month. Uh, let me see, that, uh, that will be next Wednesday. It is, of course, the case of the Comte de Tournay this time, who is now under the sentence of death. It will be rare sport to get him out of France. And you'll have a narrow escape. Young Sun Juice has actually gone to see him already. Now, no one suspects Sun Juice as yet, but to, meet the, to get them both out of the country. <laughs> Faith, it'll be a tough job, even for our chief. Well, this is all very exciting. Uh, have you any special instructions for me? Uh, yes, uh, rather more precise ones than usual. It appears that the Republican government has sent an accredited agent over to England. A man named... Uh, Ch Chauvelin... Ch Chauvelin had something in that vein. And he is said to be terribly bitter against our league. Huh, can't imagine why. Uh, well, this... Uh, Mr. C, he's brought a whole army of spies with him. And until the chief has sampled a lot, he thinks we should meet as seldom as possible, for a time. When he wants to speak to us, he will contrive to let us know. Now, you are to read these instructions and commit them to memory, then destroy them. Oh. Wait, what's that? I have the foggiest. It dropped out of your pocket just now. Uh, it certainly did not seem to be with the other paper. Strange. I wonder how it got there. It is from the chief. Who's at the door? Before either Lord Tony or Sir Andrew had time or chance to make the faintest struggle, they were each seized by two men. A muffler was quickly tied round the mouth of each, and they were pinioned to one another back to back, their arms, hands, and legs securely fastened. One man had, in the meanwhile, quietly shut the door and now stood motionless while the others completed their work. The man, having taken possession of all the papers, listened for a moment or two if there were any sound within the fisherman's rest. Evidently satisfied that this dastardly outrage had remained unheard, he once more opened the door and pointed down the passage. The four men lifted Sir Andrew and Lord Tony from the ground, and as quietly as they had come, they bore the two young, two pinioned young gallants out of the inn and along the Dover Road into the gloom beyond. Oh, not a bad day's work on the whole. Oh, my, my. Now, fair Marguerite Saint Just, I think that you will help me find the Scarlet Pimpernel. <laughs> It was one of the gala nights at Covent Garden Theatre, the first of the autumn season in this memorable year of 1793. Gluck's Orpheus made a strong appeal to the more intellectual portions of the house, whilst the gaily dressed and brilliant throng of fashionable women spoke to the eye of those who cared but little for this latest importation from Germany. Now that the curtain came down for the intermission, the audience, which had hung spellbound on the magic strains of the great maestro, seemed collectively to let loose its hundreds of waggish and frivolous tongues. In the smart orchestra boxes, many well-known faces were to be seen. The prime minister, weighed down with cares of state, was finding brief relaxation. The jovial, if somewhat coarse, Prince of Wales moved about from box to box. In Foreign Secretary Lord Grenville's box, too, a curious personality attracted everyone's attention. A small figure with shrewd, sarcastic face, attentive to the music, keenly critical audience, dressed lit black, Lord Grenville paid him marked, though frigid, deference. And the de Tournay family was there too, recently arrived from France. Uh, Lord Granville, you could not arrive more apropos. I am positively dying to hear the latest news from France. Alas, it is of the very worst, I'm afraid. The massacres continue. Paris literally reeks with blood, and the guillotine claims a hundred victims a day. 
clergymen, artists, politicians, and children now, as well as aristocrats. No, monsieur, it is dreadful to hear all that. And my poor husband still in that awful country. It is terrible for me to be sitting here in a theater, all safe and in peace, but he is in such peril. My dear madame, <laughs> your sitting in a convent won't make your husband safe. Uh, besides which, madame, did you not tell me yesterday that the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel had pledged their honor to bring Monsieur Le Comte safely across the channel? Yes, and that is my only hope. I saw George Hastings yesterday and he reassured me again. Then I am sure you need have no fear. What the League have sworn, that they surely will accomplish. <laughs> If I were but a few years younger. Yet you allow that devil to sit enthroned in your box tonight. I admit that I find him perturbing company, but you must remember that in diplomacy, we must put prejudices aside. Monsieur Chauvelin is the accredited agent of his government, and we cannot therefore refuse to receive with courtesy that agent that she s decides to send to us. You are, I think, one of the most powerful men in this country. Are you truly powerless to turn away a representative of a wicked government? Can your English government respond to this violence with nothing but courtesy? <laughs> Pardon me, madame. I really must get back to my seat. The, the opera is beginning again. Come in. A word with you, Citoyen. Mon dieu, man, you frightened me. I want to listen to Gluck here in my private box and have no mind for talking. This is my only opportunity. Lady Blakeney is always so surrounded, so feted by her court that a mere old friend has but very. You must seek out another opportunity then. I'm going to Lord Grenville's ball tonight after the opera. So are you, probably. I'll give you five minutes then. Three minutes in the privacy of this box are quite sufficient for me, and I think that you will be wise to listen to me. Brad Chauvelin? No. No, merely an arrow shot into the air. You see, your brother, Armand, is in grave peril. If you'd rather fantasize over your imaginary plots than the opera, You'd best go back to your own seat and leave me to enjoy the music. Oh no, I'm afraid this is very real. I have news for you which I think will interest you. But first, let me explain. May I? To the point, I pray you, the music is entrancing and the audience will get impatient of your talk. One moment, citoyen. The day on which I had the honor of meeting you at Dover, I obtained possession of some papers of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Some of the threads of this mysterious organization have fallen into my hands, and I want you... No, I require you to help me to gather the rest of them together. Have I not already told you that I don't care about your games? You said you were here because of my brother, not the Scarlet Pimpernel. Ah, but fate ties the two of them together. A little patience, I entreat. Two gentlemen, Lord Anthony Dewhurst and Sir Andrew Folks, were at the Fisherman's Rest at Dover that same night. I know, I saw them there. They were already known to my spies as members of the League. When the two young men were alone, my spies captured the two gallants, seized their papers, and brought them to me. You astonish me. If you could sink any lower, you'd be in the orchestra pit. <laughs> well, what about those papers? Do they reveal the secret identity of this elusive Scarlet Pimpernel? Unfortunately, no. Though they've given me cognizance of certain names, they still leave me ignorant of the name of the Scarlet Pimpernel himself. Then you are where you were before, aren't you? And you can let me enjoy the end of the aria. Had you not spoken about my brother? I'm him now. 
Among the papers, there was a letter to Sir Andrew Foulkes written by your brother, Armand Saint Just. That letter shows him to be not only in sympathy with the enemies of France, but actually a helper, perhaps even a member of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Did I not say it was some imaginary plot? Armand helping those French aristocrats whom he despises. Well, this tale does infinite credit to your imagination. Let me make my point quite clear. I must assure you that Saint Just is compromised beyond the slightest hope of pardon. Chauvelin, my friend, shall we try to understand one another? It seems that my wits have become rusty by contact with this damp climate. Now, you are very anxious to discover the identity of the Scarlet Pimpernel, isn't that so? France's most bitter enemy, Citoyen. All the more dangerous as he works in the dark. Well, and you would now force me to do some spying work for you in exchange for my brother Armand's safety, isn't that it? Two very ugly words, Marguerite. There can be no question of force, and the service which I would ask of you could never be called by the shocking name of spying. At any rate, that is what it is called over here. That is your intention, is it not? My intention is that you win a free pardon for Armand Saint Just by doing me a small service. What is it? Only watch for me tonight at Lord Grenville's ball. Among the papers which we found, there was a tiny note. See? Remember, we must not meet more often than is strictly necessary. You have all the instructions for the second. If you wish to speak to me again, I shall be at G's ball. After Dewhurst and Fuchs were searched by my spies, they were carried by my orders to an abandoned house. There they remained close prisoners until this morning. But having found this tiny scrap of paper, I determined they must be in attendance at Lord Grenville's ball. Therefore, this morning, those two young gentlemen found every bar and bolt open in that lonely house. Their jailers disappeared, and two good horses standing ready saddled and tethered in the yard. No doubt they believe their miraculous escape to have been aided by the Scarlet Pimpernel. They are sure to meet him tonight. Now you see how simple it all is, citoyen. It does seem simple, doesn't it? When you want to kill a chicken, you take hold of it, and then you wring its neck. It's only the chicken who does not find it quite so simple. Now you hold a knife at my throat and a hostage for my obedience. You may find it simple. I don't. I am offering you a gift, Marguerite. I offer you a chance of saving the baby brother you love from the consequences of his own youthful folly. What do you want me to do? You are going to the ball tonight. Simply watch and listen. You can tell me if you hear a chance word or whisper. You can note everyone to whom folks or Dewhurst will speak. Find out who the Scarlet Pimpernel is, and I swear that your brother shall be safe. If I promise to help you in this matter, Chauvelin, will you give me that letter of Armand's? If you render me useful assistance tonight, I will give you that letter. Tomorrow. You do not trust me. <laughs> of course, I trust you absolutely. But I'm not a fool. What has happened to you, Chauvelin? How did your heart grow so cold? Not cold at all, Citoyen. I feel I am on fire. Yeah, your chair's outside, my dear. I suppose you'll want to go to that damned ball. Uh, oh, excuse me, Monsieur yeah, Shepperton. I had not observed you, fantasying you here. Yeah. I've been coming, my dear. Oh, she's just, she's just so damned impudent. Uh. I'm ready to go. It is only au revoir, Chauvelin. We shall meet at Lord Grenville's ball. From the social pages of the London Gazette, the records of the Committee of Public Safety, and the private diary of Marguerite Saint-Just Blakeney, 
Lord Grenville's ball, presenting His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. A pleasure, as always. Will Your Highness permit me to introduce Citoyen Chauvelin, the accredited agent of the French government? Uh, Monsieur, we will try to forget the government that uh, sent you and look upon you merely as our guest. As such, you are welcome, Monsieur. Ah, my little Chauvelin. He and I are old friends, Your Royal Highness. Mm -hmm. Monsieur. Madame. Well, then you are doubly welcome, Monsieur. There is someone else I would crave permission to present to Your Royal Highness. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay and her daughter, who have but recently come from France. Oh, by all means. They are among the lucky ones, then. Oh, Lord, love me. Why, she looks very virtuous and very melancholy. Not at all my time. Virtues like precious odors, Your Royal Highness. Most fragrant when it is crushed. <laughs> Virtue, alas, is most unbecoming to your charming sex, madam. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay. This is a pleasure, madam. My royal father, as you know, is ever glad to welcome those of your compatriots whom France has driven from her shores. <laughs> Your Royal Highness is ever gracious. Uh, this is my daughter, Suzanne, Monseigneur. Ah, charming, charming. And now allow me, Comtesse, to introduce you to Lady Blakeney, who honors us with her friendship. Every countrywoman of Lady Blakeney's is doubly welcome for her sake. Her friends are our friends, her enemies, the enemies of England. His Royal Highness is ever gracious, Madame, but there is no need for his kind introduction. Your amiable reception of me at our last meeting still dwells pleasantly in my memory. We poor exiles, Madame, show our gratitude to England by devotion to the wishes of Monseigneur. Madame. Madame. You know, Mademoiselle Suzanne, I knew your father well when he was ambassador in London. I was no more than a child then, Monseigneur, uh, and now I owe the honor of this meeting to our protector, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Mm. All evening I've wondered if he could be here tonight. Hush, my girl, remember who is in our company. No, no, Monseigneur. Do not check this young lady's display of gratitude. The name of that interesting red flower is well known to me. And the friend. Well, why then, Monsieur, perhaps you know more about our national hero than we do ourselves. Perchance you know who he is. You see, mm -hmm. the ladies hang upon your lips. Here in England, Monsieur, we but name the Scarlet Pimpernel, and every fair cheek is suffused with a blush. We know not if he be tall or short, fair or dark, handsome or ill-formed, but we know that he is the bravest gentleman in all the world, and we feel a little proud, Monsieur, when we remember that he is an Englishman. And yet, Monseigneur, if your government could, would only provide aid to the people of France, we would not need a Scarlet Pimpernel. Why? Again, de Tournay, spoken like a true Jacobin. Perhaps we'll make a revolutionary of you yet. Well, Lord Grenville, what have you to say to that? <clears throat> I'll go see if dinner is ready. Well, I believe we were speaking of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Mm -hmm. uh, Monsieur Chauvelin, His Royal Highness should add that we ladies think of him as a hero of old. We worship him, we wear his badge, we tremble for him when he is in danger, and exult with him in the hour of his victory. <laughs> and we poor husbands, we have to stand by while they worship a damned shadow. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, an ode to the Scarlet Pimpernel by Sir Percy Blakeney, Baronet. Um, they seek him here, 
They seek him there. There's Frenchies seek him everywhere. Is he in heaven? Is he in hell? The damned elusive Pimpernel! Oh, charming, <laughs> Percy. Charming. Oh, I'll all dream up in the dying of cravat. <laughs> <laughs> Life would be a dreary desert without you. Come. I have some very special people I'd like you to meet. Ooh. <laughs> Fine evening, isn't it? I fear it looks like rain. Um, Sir Andrew, the heat in this room is terrible. I feel so faint. Uh, you are ill, Lady Blakeney. Uh, let let no, me. Nothing. A chair. There, the giddiness is passing off. At moments like these, there is no doubt that there is in us a sense which has absolutely nothing to do with the other five. It is not that we see, it is not that we hear or touch, yet we seem to do all three at once. Marguerite sat there with her eyes closed. Sir Andrew was immediately behind her, and on her right was the table with the grand candelabra upon it. But before her mental vision, there was absolutely nothing but Armand's face. Armand, whose life was in the most imminent danger. For one moment, there was dead silence in the little boudoir. Then it was that that extra sense became potent in Marguerite Blakeney. She could not see, for her eyes were closed, she could not hear, for the noise from the ballroom drowned the soft rustle of that momentous scrap of paper. Nevertheless, she knew that Sir Andrew was even now holding the paper to the flame of one of the candles. At the exact moment that it began to catch fire, she opened her eyes, raised her hand, and with two dainty fingers had taken the burning scrap of paper from the young man's hand. Then she blew out the flame and held the paper to her nostril with perfect unconcern. How thoughtful of you, Sir Andrew. Surely your grandmother taught you that the smell of burnt paper was a perfect remedy against giddiness. I assure you I feel much better already. What, still dreaming and staring? Don't tell me this is a love letter. Whichever it is, Lady Blakeney, this little note is undoubtedly mine and- No, it's the candle, Sir Andrew, quick. Oh. And in his haste to reach for the letter, Sir Andrew knocked over the candelabra. There was not much damage done. Most of the candles had blown out as the candelabra fell. Only one had ignited the paper shade over it. Sir Andrew quickly put out the flames and replaced the candelabra upon the table. But this had taken him a few seconds to do. And those seconds had been all that Marguerite needed to cast a quick glance at the paper and to note its contents. A dozen words in distorted handwriting. You will forgive me, Lady Blakeney, if I resume the interesting occupation which you had interrupted. Burn your love token by all means. And after that, will you venture to excite the jealousy of your secret admirer by asking me to dance the main lead? The few words which Marguerite Blakeney had managed to read on the half-scorched piece of paper seemed to be the words of fate. Start myself tomorrow. This she had read quite distinctly. Then came a blur caused by the smoke of the candle, which obliterated the next few words. But right at the bottom, there was another sentence, which was now standing clearly like letters of fire before her mental vision. If you wish to speak to me again, I shall be in the supper rooms at one o'clock precisely. The paper was stamped with the same little symbol, a tiny star-shaped flower which had become so familiar to her. One o'clock precisely. It was now close upon eleven. The last minuet was being danced, with Sir Andrew for folks and Lady Blakeney leading the couples through its delicate and intricate figures. Two hours more, and her fate and Armand's would be sealed. In two hours, she must make up her mind whether or not to willfully betray a brave man, a man who was noble, generous, and above all, unsuspecting. It seemed an inexcusable thing to do. But then there was Armand. Armand, too, was noble and brave, 
Armand, too, was unsuspecting, and Armand would have willingly trusted his life in her hands. And now, when she could save him from death, she hesitated. It was monstrous. Her brother's kind, gentle face, so full of love for her, seemed to be looking reproachfully at her. You might have saved me, Marco. And you chose the life of a stranger? A man you do not know, whom you have never seen, and preferred that he should be safe, whilst you sent me to the guillotine. All these conflicting thoughts raged through Marguerite's brain, while, with a smile upon her lips, she glided through the graceful mazes of the minuet. She was a finer actress at this moment, and throughout the whole of this minuet, than she had ever been upon the boards of the Comédie Française. <clears throat> you have news for me? Nothing of importance, but it might prove useful. I contrived, no matter how, to detect Sir Andrew Foulkes in the very act of burning a note from the Scarlet Pimpernel. I succeeded in casting my eye upon it for about 10 seconds. Time enough to learn its contents? Two lines. Everything else was scorched and blackened by the flame. Oh, it is lucky that the whole paper was not burned, for it might have fared ill with Armand saint Jules. What were the two lines, citoyenne? One was, I start myself tomorrow. The other, if you wish to speak to me, I shall be in the supper room at one o'clock precisely. Then I have plenty of time. What are you going to do? Oh, nothing for the present. After that, it will depend. On what? On whom I shall see in the supper room at one o'clock precisely. Sir Andrew may have warned him. I think not. When you parted from him after the minuet, he stood and watched you for a moment or two, which gave me to understand that something had happened between you. Not wanting him to leave my sight, I thereupon forced the young gentleman into a long and animated conversation about Ergluck's latest opera until pretty Mademoiselle de Tournay claimed his arm. I think that I may safely expect to find the person I seek in the dining room. There may be more than one. Whoever is there as the clock strikes one will be shadowed by one of my men. Yes, and... The papers my agents recovered in Dover speak of an inn in Calais called Les Chagris, and of a place somewhere on the coast called Père Blanchard's Hut. These have been given as the points where the traitor de Tournay and others are to meet the emissaries of the Scarlet Pimpernel. But it seems that he's decided not to send his emissaries, that he will start himself tomorrow. Now one of those persons whom I shall see in the supper room will be journeying to Calais, and I shall follow that person. For that person will be the man whom I have hunted for nearly a year. The man whose energy has outdone me, whose ingenuity has baffled me, whose audacity has set me wondering. Yes, me, who has seen a trick or two in my time. The mysterious and elusive Scarlet Pimpernel. <laughs> what about Armand? Oh, have I ever broken my word? I promise you that the day the Scarlet Pimpernel and I start for France, I will send you that imprudent letter of his by a special carrier. More than that, I will pledge you the word of France that the day I lay hands on that meddlesome Englishman, Saint Just will be here in England, safe in the arms of his charming sister. When Chauvelin reached the supper room, it was quite deserted. It looked all so peaceful, so luxurious, and so still that the keenest observer could never have guessed that, at this precise moment, it was nothing but a trap laid for the capture of the most cunning and audacious plotter those stirring times had ever seen. Even as he gazed around the room, he felt a strange feeling of awe creeping all down his spine. It is just as it should be. I am sure the Pimpernel has not been warned. I'm sure Marguerite has not played me false. 
<clears throat> well, no matter if she has. But no, no, I am acting a fool. Of course she wouldn't. Why are my hands trembling? Who's there? As he surveyed the solitude of the room, the agent became aware of the peaceful, monotonous breathing of one of Lord Grenville's guests. Chauvelin looked round once more, and there, in the corner of a sofa, in the dark angle of the room, his mouth open, his eyes shut, reclined the outlandishly apparelled husband of the cleverest woman in Europe. No doubt the idiot, deep in dreamless sleep, would not interfere with Chauvelin's trap for catching the Scarlet Pimpernel. Following the example of Sir Percy, he too stretched himself out in the corner of another sofa, shut his eyes, opened his mouth, gave forth sounds of peaceful breathing, and waited. Oh, splendid. There you are, Lady Blakeney. I located your husband at last and gave him your message. He said that he would give orders at once for the horses to be put to. For a moment, I thought he'd gone home and forgotten his wife behind him. So you did find him after all. Yes, he was in the supper room, fast asleep. I could not manage to wake him up at first. Thank you very much. May I fetch you anything? You seem ailing, Lady Blakeney. Oh, I'm only tired. It's getting late. Lord Grenville, uh, did you perceive who was in the dining room just now besides Sir Percy? Only the agent of the French government, Monsieur Chauvelin, equally fast asleep in another corner. Why does your ladyship ask? Uh, no matter. I merely wish to thank Sir Andrew for his gallantry. <laughs> Shall I find out if your ladyship's coach is ready? Oh, thank you, if you would be so kind. you are, my little Chauvelin. I believe my coach is outside. May I claim your arm? Certainly. Let us walk this way. It is less crowded. Mm. Chauvelin, I must know what has happened. What has happened, dear lady? Where? When? You are torturing me. I have helped you tonight. Now surely I have the right to know. What happened in the dining room at one o'clock just now? Quiet and peace reigned supreme. At that hour, I was asleep in the corner of one sofa and Sir Percy Blakeney in another. Nobody came into the room at all? Nobody. Then we have failed, you and I. Why, <laughs> yes, we have failed. Perhaps. But Armand? Ah, sadly, Armand Saint Just's chances hang on a thread. Pray heaven that the thread may not snap. You promised me. I remember my promise. The day that the Scarlet Pimpernel and I meet on French soil, Saint Just will be in the arms of his charming sister. The brave man's blood will be on my hands. His blood or that of your brother? Surely, at the present moment, you must hope, as I do, that the enigmatical Scarlet Pimpernel will start for Calais today. I am only conscious of one hope, Citoya. And that is? That Satan, your master, will have need of you elsewhere before the sun rises today. <laughs> you flatter me, Marguerite. At Blakeney Manor, just outside of London, from the private diary of Marguerite Saint Just Blakeney and the letters of Sir Percy's butler, Frank. After the carriage pulled up in front of the manor and Sir Percy helped her down, Marguerite lingered outside for a moment and stared at Sir Percy while he gave a few orders to the footman. He apparently did not notice her, for after a few moments' pause, he presently turned back towards the house and walked straight up to the terrace. Sir Percy. At your service, madame. Will you not stay a while? The hour is not yet late. 
Or is my company so distasteful to you that you are in a hurry to rid yourself of it? Oh, nay, madame. But tis on the other foot the shoe happens to be, and I'll warrant you you'll find the midnight air more poetic without my company. No doubt the sooner I remove the obstruction, the better your ladyship will like it. You mistake me, Sir Percy. This estrangement, which has arisen between us, was none of my making, remember? Begad, you must pardon me there, madame. My memory is always, always the shortest. The shortest? How it must have altered. Was it three years ago or four that you saw me for one hour in Paris? When you came back two years later, you had not forgotten me. You said you desired my presence, madame. I take it it was not with a view to indulging in tender reminiscences. And why not? The present is not so glorious that I should not wish to dwell a little in the past. <laughs> Pardon me, madame, if my dull wits cannot accompany you there. Sir Percy. Your servant, madame. Is it possible that love can die? I would thought that the passion which you once felt for me would outlast the span of human life. There's nothing left of that love already. With what object, I pray you? I, I do not understand you. Well, it's simple enough. I humbly put the question to you, for my slow wits are unable to grasp the cause of this, your ladyship's sudden new mood. Do you wish to see me once more a lovesick suppliant at your feet, that you might again have the pleasure of kicking me aside like a troublesome lapdog? I was vain and frivolous. I married you, hoping in my heart that your great love for me would beget in me a love for you. Is that what you wanted me to admit? 24 hours after I married, madame, the Marquis de Saint-Cyr and his family all perished on the guillotine, and the popular rumor reached me that it was the wife of Sir Percy Blakeney who helped to send them there. No. I myself told you the truth. Not till after it had been recounted to me by strangers with all of its horrible details. And you believed them. All there without proof or question. You believed that I, whom you vowed you loved more than life, could do a thing so base as that. That had you listened, I would have told you how I was duped. I, who that same popular rumor would endow with the sharpest wits in France. I was tricked into doing this terrible thing by men who knew how to play upon my love for my only brother and my desire for revenge. Was it unnatural that I should speak out about an act of horrific tyranny? Before I met you, Armand was all in all to me. We had no parents, so we brought one another up. He was my little father and I his tiny mother. And then one day, the Marquis de Saint-Cyr had my brother tortured by his lackeys in a public street where anyone could see. And his offense, that he, a plebeian, had dared to fall in love with the Marquis's daughter. For that, he was thrashed like a dog and left for dead. He will carry those injuries for the rest of his life. And every time I see my brother's scars, they remind me of the savage disregard for human life of which some men are capable, including those who seem to be perfect gentlemen. I'll admit that when I was able to take my revenge, I took it. But I only thought to bring the Marquis to disgrace and humiliation, not death, and certainly not his wife and children. I confess to you that my memory is short. But the thought certainly lingered in my mind that at the time of the Marquis's death, I entreated you for an explanation of those noisome rumors. Had you spoken but one word, I would have accepted any explanation and believed it. But you left without a word beyond the a bold confession of the horrible facts. You returned to your brother's house and left me alone for weeks, not knowing in whom to believe, since the shrine which contained my one illusion may shattered to the earth at my feet. You see, I, I know I've kept too much from you, but that ends now. 
I wish to speak to you tonight because, because I was in trouble and in need of your sympathy. What's your hand? It is yours to command, madame. It's Armand. He's in deadly danger. A letter of his rash and petulant as per usual and written to Sir Andrew Folks has fallen into the hands of a fanatic. Armand is hopelessly compromised. Tomorrow, perhaps, he will be arrested after that, the guillotine. Unless, oh, it's too horrible to say. And you do not understand, you cannot, and I have no one to whom I can turn for help, even for sympathy. Oh, sink me, madam, will you dry your tears? I could, I could never bear to see a pretty woman cry, and I... Will you not turn to me, Marguerite, and, and tell me in, in what way I may have the honor to serve you? You do anything for Armand, anything at all. You have so much influence at court and so many friends. Should you not rather ask the influence of your, your French friend, uh, Shabba Chip, the, the small fellow dressed in black? I cannot ask him, Percy. I wish I had the courage to tell you before, but it is he who has put a price on my brother's head. I pray you. Have no fear. I give you my word, Armand shall be safe. Now, um, have I your permission to go? The, the, the hour is getting late. You will at least accept my thanks. Oh, it is too soon, madame. I haven't done and nothing as yet. The hour's late. You must be fatigued. The woman will be waiting for you upstairs, okay? But had she but turned back then, and looked out once more onto the rose-lit garden, she would have seen a strong man overwhelmed with his own passion and his own despair. Pride had given way at last, obstinacy was gone, the will was powerless. He was once more but a man madly, blindly in love, and as soon as her light footsteps had died away within the house, he knelt down upon the terrace steps and kissed the places where her foot had trodden and the stone balustrade where her hand had rested last. The morning after the ball at Blakeney Manor from the private diary of Lady Marguerite Saint Just Blakeney. Good morning, Lady Blakeney. Have you slept well? Well, as could be expected. What do you mean, ma'am? Are you ill? No, no, just a little fatigued from last night's excitement. Have um have you seen my husband? As a matter of fact, ma'am, he left you this letter this morning. Oh. In most unforeseen circumstances forces me to leave for the north on business immediately, so I beg your ladyship's pardon if I do not avail myself of the honor of bidding you goodbye. I remain your ladyship's most humble and obedient servant, Percy Blakeney. Louise, did he say anything else before he left? Any reason for this sudden departure? No, ma'am. He only said to give this to you first thing. Well, that's very strange. But Sir Percy has always been a bit of an eccentric. If you say so, ma'am. Oh, and you asked me to remind you, you have a guest arriving this afternoon. Suzanne de Tournay, of course, I nearly forgot. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. With the whole morning to fill up before Suzanne's arrival, Marguerite crossed the landing outside her own suite of apartments and stood still for a moment at the head of the fine oak staircase that led to the lower floor. At the extreme end of the landing stood a small study which Percy hardly ever used and was always kept locked. Only his own special and confidential valet, Frank, had keys to this room. Marguerite had often laughingly declared that he strictly excluded all prying eyes from his sanctum for fear that they should detect how very little study went on within its four walls. She was unsure whether Percy even owned a single volume, let alone a library. Today, it stood open. 
A sudden burning curiosity seized her to have a look inside. Gently, on tiptoe, she crossed the landing, and like Bluebeard's wife, she paused a moment on the threshold, strangely perturbed and irresolute. The door was ajar, and she could not see anything within. She pushed it open tentatively. There was no sound. Frank was evidently not there. And she walked in. At once she was struck by the severe simplicity of everything around her, which in no way recalled to her mind the lazy man about town and dandified leader of fashion that she knew to be Sir Percy Blakeney. Maps of France and the North Coast. What would you need with these? What is this? She turned and looked at the ponderous desk. It was covered with a mass of papers, all neatly tied and docketed, with perfect method. Mounts? Receipts? Does he manage these himself? It had never before occurred to Marguerite to ask how Sir Percy, whom all the world had credited with a total lack of brains, administered the vast fortune which his father had left him. She was now almost certain that he was not only wearing a mask, but was playing a deliberate and studied part. Why take all this trouble? Why should a serious man of business wish to appear before his fellow men, before his wife, as an empty-headed nincompoop? Her head began to ache, and she turned away from this strange chamber, which she had entered and which she did not understand. With a last look round, she once more turned to the door. As she did so, her foot knocked against a small object, which now went rolling right across the room. She stooped to pick it up and turned it over in her fingers. It was a solid gold ring with a flat shield, on which was engraved a symbol, a small star-shaped flower, a sh of a shape she had seen so distinctly twice before once at the opera, and once at Lord Grenville's ball. Madame? Madame, where are you? Madame, a letter arrived for you. Just come by runner. Mon Dieu, there you are. Never seen you in this part of the house before. Mm. Uh, who sent it? The runner said it, that his orders were to deliver this, and that your ladyship would understand from whom it came. It's from my brother, Armand. Is there Andrew Folks? How nice, ma'am. The letter that Chauvelin's spy stole in Dover, he's kept his word. Louise? Yes, ma'am? I fear I must not see Suzanne today. When she arrives, tell her I'm indisposed. Prepare a traveling dress and a cloak for me, my coach, and the four swiftest horses in the stables to be ready at once. Yes, ma'am. May I ask? What am I doing? Oh, I'm the only one who can fix it. Her very blindness in not having guessed her husband's secret seemed now to her another deadly sin. But there was no time now to go over the past. Now she must repay, not by empty remorse, but by prompt and useful action. All these lives, Percy, Armand, Suzanne's father, lay in Marguerite's hands. She knew now that Percy would never abandon those who trusted in him, that he would not turn back from dangers. But if he failed, then at least she would be there by his side to comfort, love, and cherish, uh, to cheat death perhaps at the last by making it seem sweet with the supreme happiness of knowing that all misunderstandings were at an end. Without haste, but without hesitation, she walked quietly into the house. Sir Andrew for Folk's estate, London. Sir Andrew? Lady Blakeney, to what way you the pleasure? I have no desire to waste valuable time in talk. You must take certain things I'm going to tell you for granted. What is important is that your leader and friend, the Scarlet Pimpernel, my husband, Percy is in deadly peril. Surely you do that. No matter how I know this, thank God that I do, and perhaps it is not too late to save him. Unfortunately, I cannot do this quite alone, and therefore I have come to you for help. Lady Blakeney, I... Will you just listen to me first? 
When the French agents captured you in Dover, they found your plans for the rescue of the Comte de Tournay and others. Percy left for France this morning. Chauvelin must know by now that he and the Scarlet Pimpernel are one and the same person. You know as well as I do the fate that awaits Percy at the hands of the revolutionary government. But not only that, he will have also been unconsciously the means of revealing the hiding place of the Comte de Tournay, my brother Armand, and all of those who even now are placing their hopes in him. I do not understand. I think you do, Sir Andrew. My husband may have fooled me into believing he was an idiot, but I won't believe it of you. You do not trust me. Mon Dieu, can you not see that I am in deadly earnest? Tell me, do I look like that vilest thing on earth, a woman who would betray her own husband? God forbid that I should ascribe such evil motives to you, but... What? Will you tell me whose hand helped to guide Chauvelin to the knowledge which you say he now possesses? Mine. I own it. I will not lie to you, but I had no idea, how could I have, of the Scarlet Pimpernel's true identity? And my brother's life was to be the prize if I helped Chauvelin discover it. It's no use telling you how he forced my hand, but we are wasting time, Sir Andrew. This is all that matters. Someone we both love is in deadly peril. Help me save him. God knows you have perplexed me so thoroughly that I do not know which way my duty lies. Tell me what you wish me to do. There are 19 of us, all ready to lay down our lives for the Scarlet Pimpernel. There is no need for lives just now, my friend. My wits and four swift horses will serve the necessary purpose, but I must know where to find him. If you will not help me, I will still strive to save my husband. I will still exert every faculty I possess for his sake, but I might be powerless, for I might arrive too late. Nothing will be left for you but lifelong remorse, and for me, a broken heart. But Lady Blakeney, uh, do you know that what you propose on doing is man's work? Man's work? Tell me which of us knows anything of working for a living. I was not always the wife of a baronet, Sir Andrew. I did not mean to offend, but you cannot possibly go to Calais alone. You'd be running the greatest possible risks to yourself, and your chances of finding your husband, even if I were to direct you ever so carefully, are infinitely remote. There are risks. I hope there are dangers too. I have so much to atone for. Faith, madam, you must command me. If you will go yourself. Did you not see that I would go mad if I let you go without me? You will trust me. I await your orders. Listen then. We meet at nightfall at the fisherman's rest in Dover. Chauvelin would avoid it as he's known there, and I think it would be the safest. I will gladly accept your escort to Calais. As you say, I might miss Sir Percy even should you direct me ever so carefully. We'll charter a schooner and cross over during the night. Disguised, if you will agree to it, as my lackey, I think you will escape detection. I am entirely at your service, madam. Every step that Percy takes on, in French, on French soil is fraught with danger. Thank you, Sir Andrew. We meet tonight at Dover. There'll be a race between Chauvelin and me across the channel tonight. The prize, the life of the Scarlet Pimpernel. At the Fisherman's Rest in Dover, from the accounts of Mr. Jellyband and the papers of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh, Lady Blakeney, well, this is a surprise. Uh, will your ladyship stay the night? No, not the whole night. I need no other room than this, just for an hour, please. It is at your ladyship's service. I shall be crossing over at the first turn of the tide and in the first schooner I can get, but my coachman and men will stay the night, so I hope you will make them comfortable. Oh, and as soon as Sir Andrew Folks comes, show him in here. Yes, my lady. Uh, Sally, dinner for the fancy folk. Hurry! <laughs> Don't wait up, Jellyband, or Miss Sally either. Sir Andrew may be late. Ah, and here's my faithful lackey. I'm sorry, friend, uh, but we have a private party this evening, and we it's won't have... Man. It's only me. Oh, oh, well, begging your pardon, sir. I've learned not to ask too many questions of your lot. 
If I hadn't been expecting you, I may not have recognized you either. I learned well from Sir Percy, ma'am. And he learned well from you. Pardon? Well, that was his reason for spending so much time at the theatre in the first place. Acting lessons from afar, I suppose. Studying how performers change their bodies, their faces, their voices, to become different people. Oh, I mean, naturally, he studied where the theatre's got their best costumes and wigs. It isn't easy to trick the agents of the Committee of Public Safety. No, it certainly isn't. I suppose everyone sees what they expect to see. People gossip. Sir Percy Blakeney spent £500 on his suit for the ball. Now, true, he spent £500 at the tailor's last month, but that princely sum included French guard uniforms for the 20 of us. He simply wears his suits like they cost £500, and people believe it. Still so much I don't know about him. He's dedicated his life to something that earns him no glory, no fame, no praise, just for... Well, why do you do it? Why should Englishmen care about the French Revolution? For sport? <laughs> That's what Lord Tony says, at any rate. Well, I suppose idle rich men want some aim in life after all. Whereas some rich men hunt and kill animals for the sheer excitement of the sport, you're saving men, women, and children from death. I think of worse pastime. As could I. Uh, but in truth, there is, it is more than a pastime, for me and most certainly for Sir Percy. This work is uh, a matter of gravest importance. Because as aristocrats, you believe the French Revolution to be wrong. As a matter of fact, because we believe it to be right. In a manner of speaking. What do you mean? Well, I think you know exactly what I mean. I know you've long held Republican leanings of your own, believed in liberty and equality yourself. Yes, but not in the death of innocent people. Of course not, and nor do we. But doesn't it eat away at you, Lady Blakeney? wandering around the gorgeous manner that Sir Percy inherited from generations of Blakeneys, wearing the finest fashions to parties with princes, taking pleasure cruises on your husband's yacht, and knowing how many can never dream of a life like yours. You know nothing of how I feel. Perhaps not, but that is how I feel. And it's how Sir Percy feels, and the rest of our band too. We knew how fortunate we were, to be born into wealth and title? What? And we knew now, watching the carnage in France, how easily those fortunes could have been reversed. How it could have been us instead of the French aristos. We were no better than them. What good did we do with all the fortune and position we'd been granted? Nothing. So we resolved to do something. We wanted to prove, if only to ourselves, that we could use what we had to do good. And I tell you, it may sound pompous, but I never truly realized how hollow my life had been until I joined the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. And perhaps many of the people we rescue from the guillotine truly are scoundrels and leeches, and perhaps their lives aren't worth saving. But perhaps once they're safe in England, they'll remember one good turn and pass it on to other unfortunate souls. Uh, Faith, I'm sorry, Lady Blakeney. I, I, I'm speaking nonsense. No, not at all. Your husband is a remarkable man, Lady Blakeney. Yes, he is. And I hope we can save him tonight. Uh, tonight? I'm afraid that will not be possible. Not cross over tonight. There can be no question of cannot. Whatever it must may cost, we must get a vessel tonight. I'm afraid it's not a question of cost, Lady Blakeney. For once, money cannot solve everything. There is a nasty storm blowing in from France, and the wind is dead against us. We cannot possibly sail until it is changed. But there's no time. Can't we find another way? I've been down to the shore already, and a talk, and I had a talk with one or two skippers. Every sailor has assured me that no one could possibly sail from Dover tonight. So you mean Chauvelin is in the same quandary? Oh, but then he may have left before the storm broke out. In that case, we may even now be lying at the bottom of the sea, but I'm afraid we cannot build our hopes upon the shipwreck of that cunning devil. 
The sailors I spoke to all assured me that no schooner had put out of Dover in several hours. So Chauvelin is still here in Dover? Undoubtedly. Shall I go waylay him and run my sword through him? And where indeed the quickest way out of the difficulty? Unfortunately, it is only in our beautiful France that your quick approach to problem solving is condoned. But let us see if Jellyband has a few spare rooms for us. We certainly will need our rest if we're to have our wits about us in France. That we will. Oh, and uh, so Andrew. Uh, yes. Your true friend. Sir Percy is lucky to have you. As he is to have you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm doing my best to deserve him. The pair set sail at dawn the next day. The sunrise was glorious after the storm, and Marguerite, as she watched the white cliffs of Dover gradually disappear from view, felt almost hopeful. Gradually, the gray coast of France began to emerge from the fast-gathering evening mists. One or two lights could be seen flickering and the spires of several churches to rise out of the surrounding haze. What seemed like mere moments later, Marguerite had landed upon French shore. She was back in that country that she scarcely recognized. The streets were narrow, torturous, and mostly evil-smelling, with a mixture of stale fish and damp cellar odors. There had been heavy rain here during the storm last night, and sometimes Marguerite sank ankle-deep in the mud, for the roads were not lighted. But she did not heed any of these petty discomforts. We may find Percy here, Le, cha Le Chagris. English travellers, citoyen. Ah, oh, sacré Anglais. What an awful place. Are you sure this is the right address? It is the place, all right, but I never saw a more villainous hole. Hey, our host is not a cheerful fellow, and I would, I would, I could offer you more comfortable surroundings, but I think you'll find the soup eatable and the wine good. My mind is scarce inclined to dwell on thoughts of supper. Uh, hey, my friend, do you see many of our quality in these parts? Many English travellers, I mean. Oh, sometimes. <laughs> English travellers always know where to get good wine. Hey, my friend. <laughs> Now tell me, uh, my lady was desiring to know if you happen to have seen a friend of hers, a tall Englishman who often comes to Calais on business. Uh, tall Englishman? Uh, today? <laughs> oui. <laughs> Sacre aristo. <laughs> That's my husband, right enough, and not even in disguise. Running into the wildest dangers with the latest pet coat upon his back and his cravat unruffled. Uh. Uh, yes, my friends, uh, but my lord always wears beautiful clothes, uh, and, and he's gone, you say? Uh, he went, eh? but uh, coming back, he ordered supper. <laughs> here? Coming here tonight, but where is he now? Je ne sais quoi. I have said enough, huh? He came today, he ordered supper, he went out, he come back, voila! Faith, madam, I think we'd better leave him alone. We shall not get anything out nor out of him, and we might arouse his suspicions. One never knows what spies may be lurking around these godforsaken places. The very walls have ears in France these days. Yeah. Are we alone, monsieur my lackey? May we talk? As cautiously as possible. Chauvelin knows of this inn from the papers he stole, and on landing, you will make straight for it. If those sailors in Dover spoke the truth, that he is not landed yet, and Percy will be here directly, we shall be mid-channel before Chauvelin has realized that we have slipped through his fingers. Faith, madam, in making your rose-colored plans, you are forgetting the most important factor. What in the world do you mean? It stands at six foot high and goes by the name of Percy Blakeney. I don't understand. Do you think that Percy would leave Calais without having accomplished what he set out to do? There's the old Comte de Tournay and your brother Armand, and others, fugitives as they are, these men at this moment await with perfect confidence the arrival of the Scarlet Pimpernel, who has pledged his honor to rescue them. 
would he turn his back on them? Never. Oh. Sir Andrew, you are right. And I would not shame myself by trying to dissuade him from his duty. In the meanwhile, I think we should lose no time. I still feel that his safety depends on his knowing that Chauvelin is on his track. Undoubtedly. He has wonderful resources at his command, and his ingenuity is a veritable miracle. I'm sure he will think of something. Then what say you to a voyage of reconnaissance in the village while I wait for him here to come? You may come across Percy and save us some valuable time. Wait here alone? In this villainous hole? I don't mind. I'm accustomed to going on chaperoned in France, remember? But you might ask our surly host if he could let me wait in another room, away from the prying eyes of any chance traveler. She can wait up in the attic. It's comfortable enough, and I have no other friend. Nothing could be better. <laughs> Give him the money, Sir Andrew. I shall be quite happy up there and can see everything without being seen. May I entreat you, madam, to do nothing rash? Do not, I beg of you, reveal yourself to Sir Percy unless you are absolutely certain that you are alone with him. I do believe you are patronizing me, Sir Andrew. I'm not so giddy with love as to lose my head entirely. Poor choice of words in France. I dare not kiss your hand, madam, since I am your lackey. But farewell. If I do not come across Percy in half an hour, I shall return here. God grant that either you or I may have seen Percy by then. Good luck to you, friend. Have no fear for me. As observed by Marguerite Saint Just Blakeney from the attic loft of Le Chat Gris, one half hour later. A plate of soup and a bottle of wine, then clear out of here. Understand? I want to be alone. Oui, citoyen. <laughs> now, citoyen Dega, the English schooner. He was lost sight of at sundown, citoyen, but was then seen, seen making west toward Cap Grenet. Ah, good. And now, about Agent L. What did he say? He assured me that all the orders you sent him last week have been implicitly obeyed. All the roads which converge to this place have been patrolled night and day ever since, and the beaches and cliffs most rigorously searched and guarded. Excellent. And does he know where this Père Blanchard's hut is? No, Citoyen, nobody seems to know of it by that name. There are fishermen's huts all along the coast, of course, but... That'll do. Now, return to Agent Ero and tell him to come meet with me tonight. The men are to keep the sharpest possible lookout for any stranger who may be walking, riding, or driving along the road or the beach, whom I need not describe further, as probably he will be disguised. You understand? Perfectly, Citoya. Very well, then. Go and see Elro at once. I shall send him to you, Citoya. You cannot miss him. He's very tall and wears a long blue coat and bandage over his eye. A souvenir from the, his last encounter with the Scarlet Pimpernel's men. God save our gracious king. God save our noble king. God save the king. Ah. Percy. Hello there, now and about, where's that fool innkeeper? Ah, oh, Lord Space, I'm a sure Shabbat, uh, Shabbat, sure. fancy meeting you here. Oh, damn sorry, I seem to have said you, eating soup too. That's an awkward thing, soup begat. A friend of mine died once and choked, just like you with a spoonful of soup all the time. You don't mind if I join you? Oh, any friend of my wife's is a friend of mine, is what I always say. Oh, I am indeed charmed to see you, Sir Percy. Mm. You must excuse me. <clears throat> I thought you were on the other side of the channel. Sudden surprise almost took my breath away. Yes, <laughs> didn't just, Mr. Chubberton. Pardon me. Chauvelin. Oh, I beg pardon. A thousand times, yes. Chavelin, of course. I never could cotton for her names. Mm, I hope Lady Blakeney is well. Oh, quite well, quite well, thank you. Don't so, so silly at ball the other day. Uh, too tired to go travelling with me, I'm afraid, today. Hmm. You're on your 
Way to Paris, Sir Percy. Oh, good heavens, no. Only as far as Lily to visit the, the haberdash and beastly uncomfortable place, Paris, just now. No offense, meant Monsieur Chabot, Chab, pardon, uh, Chablin, J J Chevrolet. J J You're in a hurry, sir. I pray you take no heed of me. Mm. Oh, are you expecting a friend, maybe? Yes, a friend. Oh, a fair lady, I trust. Well, uh, I say, come by the fire. It's so damned cold. Um, as Monsieur Chaffalon, tell me, I, I pray you, is, is your friend pretty? Is a friend ready? Uh, damn smart, these French little little, little French women sometimes. No, 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 no. <laughs> Did you say something, sir? No, uh, that is. You were saying, Sir Percy. I was saying that the tobacconist in Piccadilly has sold me better snuff this time than I've ever tasted. But you honor me. I, I, I know you're a great connoisseur of the stuff. Hmm. A joke! Only he who has ever by accident sniffed vigorously a dose of pepper can have the faintest conception of the hopeless condition in which such a sniff would reduce any human being. Chauvelin felt as if his head would burst. Sneeze after sneeze seemed nearly to choke him. He was blind, deaf, and dumb for the moment. And during that moment, Blakeney quietly, without the slightest haste, took up his hat, took some money out of his pocket, which he left on the table, and then calmly stalked out of the room. Half an hour later, from the records of the Committee of Public Safety, in the private diary of Lady Marguerite Saint-Just Blakeney. Citoyen, Citoyen Chauvelin, the tall Englishman! was here in this room 30 minutes ago having supper at that table. Damn his impudence! I dared not tackle him alone as that cursed English Englishman appears to have the strength of a bullock. And so he slipped away under my very nose. Quite literally, in fact. Citoyen, Agent Heron sent 40 men as reinforcements for the patrol duty. They apprehended the Englishman in the street on his way to the coast. Blakeney. Captured alive. My God, Percy. Citoya, what was... Go get her. Now. Let me go. Dear me, Lady Blakeney. Oh, this is indeed a charming surprise, but I'm afraid we won't be letting you go anywhere, except with us. Dago, bind her hands. Oh, and gag her. I believe that we may be able to use her to get some helpful information from the Scarlet Pimpernel. And if not, well, we still have another traitor for Madame Guillotine. Where is Errol now? On the St. Martin Road. Tell him we will meet him there. They're heading to the seacoast before dawn. That noble and gallant English gentleman, the Scarlet Pimpernel, has agreed to lead him to the Comte de Tournay and Armand Saint-Just in exchange for his life. <laughs> so much for his reputation for unparalleled bravery. Percy would never betray Armand. Never. I thought I told you to silence her. Her senses were leaving her. Half choked with the tight grip round her mouth, she had no strength to move or to utter the faintest sound. The feeling of blank despair seemed to have completely paralyzed her brain and nerves. Chauvelin have, must have given some directions, for she felt herself lifted from off her feet. The bandage around her mouth was made more secure, and a pair of arms carried her away from the Chagri and the last faint glimmer, glimmer of hope for her husband. When Marguerite awoke, she was inside a small, cramped hackney coach, surrounded by armed guards. Chauvelin rode in this carriage with her. For an hour, she sat looking out on the endless monotony of the road, on the drops of rain that pattered against the window glass and ran down from it like a perpetual storm stream of tears. Another hackney coach traveled ahead of them, with an armed man riding on horseback at either door and two more following at a distance of twenty paces. In the darkness, she could barely make out Agent Heron's ugly face, crowned with a battered hat, his eyes swathed in a bandage, 
appearing from time to time at the window of the coach. She had heard an armed guard tell Chauvelin that the prisoner was with Citizen Aron inside this coach, in irons. Of all this, Marguerite had been conscious in a vague, dreamy kind of way. She seemed to herself like the spectator in a moving panoramic drama, unable to raise a finger to stop that final, inevitable ending when the dreary curtain would fall on the last act. Before that handkerchief is removed from your pretty mouth, I think it right to give you one small word of warning. What has procured me the honor of being followed across the channel by so delightful a companion I cannot, of course, conceive. But I suspect the purpose of this attention is not one that would commend itself to my vanity. Inside Père Blanchard's hut, if I am not mistaken, your brother Armand Saint-Just waits with that traitor de Tournay and two other men unknown to you for the arrival of the audacious Scarlet Pimpernel. It only rests with yourself that your brother shall be free to go off with you tonight. What I want you to do to ensure Armand's safety is a very simple thing, dear lady. What? To remain in the carriage without a sound after I get out. Ah, but I think you will obey. For let me tell you that if you scream, nay, if you utter one sound or attempt to move from here, my men will seize your loving husband, Sanzus, de Tournay, and their two friends and shoot them here by my orders before your eyes. There, now your hands are free. You may remove your gag. I think we were once friends, Chauvelin. Don't you hear yourself? Do you realize that what you're saying is monstrous? And you think that you were once a citizen of the French Republic, Madame. If you want to look at a real monster, look at men like the Marquis de Saint-Cyr. That's the kind of man your husband wants to save to spirit away to England and see he faces no consequences for his cruelty. I am only eliminating the obstacles to a better world. Unfortunately, you and your family have proven quite significant obstacles. Sir Andrew said that the Pimpernel's League, Percy's League, hopes that if they do one good turn, the Aristos will, they rescue, will pass it on to someone else. <laughs> oh, but you don't really believe that, do you? These are people who only take and take and take and give nothing back. They have not thought of anything but themselves. I'm sure that's true about many of them, but does it not make your heart ache to think that you may have condemned even one good, innocent soul to death? Your tribunal judges so quickly. Even if there was one truly good soul left alive amongst the Aristos in France, their very innocence is a testament to the fortunate sheltered lives their kind leads. No poor child on the streets has the privilege of staying innocent for long. Well, I think you are living proof of that, Citoyen. But I would rather execute a hundred innocent souls than let one guilty man walk free and become a danger to our Republic. And I would rather free a hundred people who don't deserve the kindness than put one innocent person to death. <laughs> but you're forgetting. You already have. Son Steer's wife and children. And soon it will be more if you're not careful. I refuse. Don't let you make me feel guilty anymore, Chauvelin. You talk of poor children on the street, but what do you know of fighting to survive? Remember when I first met you in our little salon? You were a lawyer. You and Percy and Andrew and the rest of you men with your ideals and principles and comfortable beds can judge me all you like, but every choice I've made has been to protect myself and those I love. I'm honored that you remember my bed so vividly, citoyen. <laughs> ah. Here we are, Père Blanchard's hut, a lovely summer getaway home on the beach for the richest man in England. Marguerite peered through the dark window of the carriage at a rough construction of wood haphazardly placed on the cliffs, 
which looked like a shed where a fisherman might keep his tools and nets. It would have looked long abandoned were it not for a plume of smoke issuing through a door at the back. She heard nothing save the soft and measured footsteps of Percy's enemies in front. She saw nothing but that wooden hut. And in her mind's eye, her husband, imprisoned, maybe unconscious, so nearby, yet utterly unreachable. Remember, do not stir from this carriage or Armand dies. I'm leaving an armed guard at the door. Now, Agent Errol, we shall see if the man you led us to is his precious Comte de Tournay, after all. Wait by the door while I- Thank you, Chevlon. I'll take it from here. Jacques, park my carriage near the back door of the hut so that I may pursue the prisoners should they attempt to flee that way. You, you, stand guard outside. The Scarlet Pimpernel may be disarmed and tied up, but he's still dangerous. Agent Arrow, this is my mission. I believe I have the Scarlet Pimpernel in my carriage, and I believe it was I who persuaded him to lead us here. You've clearly shown that you can't manage this work on your own. Remind me, you attended how many social functions with this man before you deduced that he was a Scarlet Pimpernel? The man's own wife did not even know that he was the Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh, is that so? Or was she working for him all along and you were foolish enough to believe her? Now that we're quite done, I'll enter the house and produce the prisoners. Guards, draw your weapons. Chevlan, wait at the front entrance in case any of them try to run for their lives. Yes, Citoya. My little Chevlan, this is how your fellow agents treat you. No wonder you've spent so much time in England of late. The people are much pleasanter. I am warning you, Marguerite. And do stop calling me my little Sovala. We are the same height. <laughs> what is it? They're gone. The heart is empty. They've all gone. Impossible. Get away from the door. I'm going in. They may still be hiding in there. Quick, look in every direction. They can't have gotten far. Go. Let no man escape alive. No man, but Armand, Chauvelin promised. Ah! Here, just inside the door, a letter with that infernal mark of the Scarlet Pimpernel. When you receive this, know that Agent Elro has discovered your hiding place. You must fly this place at once. Some of my men will meet you at the creek that stands opposite La Chagri near Calais. I fear this may be the end of the Scarlet Pimpernel, but do not let it be the end of your story. Uh, All the way back to the end? They'll be traveling on foot. We can overtake them and arrive at La Chagri first. If there really is a creek there. There is, Citoya. I know it well. But these Parisian prisoners do not know these cliffs as I do. In any case, they will be proceed cautiously for fear of the patrols. There's a chance to get them yet. A thousand francs to each man who gets to that creek before the Comte de Tourme. I expect to hear from all of you before sunrise. Are you not leading us there? No, the, the guards can take you. I would not risk bringing the Scarlet Pimpernel within such cl close proximity to his men and his prisoners, bound and shackle though he is. I shall meet you at Le Chagri as soon as I've safely transported Blakeney to prison. Take his wife with you, too. Hmm? She's been hiding in my carriage. The fool thought she could actually rescue her husband, but she only sealed her own fate. <laughs> Chauvelin, please. You don't have to do this. I much regret, Lady Blakeney, that circumstances over which I have no control compel me to leave you here for the moment. But I go away secure in the knowledge that I do not leave you unprotected. Au revoir, fair lady. Remember me to Sir Percy. Marguerite listened, half dazed as she was, to the fast retreating sounds of horses and the French guards. How long she lay there, she knew not. Her brain only remained conscious of its ceaseless, 
its intolerable torture of fear and uncertainty. Suddenly, a sound, the strangest, undoubtedly, that these lonely cliffs of France had ever heard, broke the silent solemnity of the shore. So strange it was that Marguerite, wearied as she was, thought that the beneficial unconsciousness of the approach of death was playing her senses a weird and elusive trick. It was the sound of a good, solid, absolutely British damn. Damn! Great Lord, I've worn that wretch's clothes for over two hours. It feels as though the dirt had penetrated my bones. Percy? You can't be. Oh. Can you walk, my dear? Do they hurt you? Oh, lean on me, it's not far to my carriage. Not to hear you. <laughs> hey, oh, I haven't been shaved in for 24 hours. I must look a disgusting object. As for these bandages and a pulling hat, well, ugh. ugh. If only you knew. I do know everything, dear. And, and you ever forgive me? You have nothing to forgive. Your heroism, your devotion, which... I also, so little deserved, have more than atoned for that unfortunate episode at the ball. No, oh, you heard about that too. But had I but known what a noble heart yours was, my Margot, I should have trusted you as you deserve to be trusted, and you would not have had to undergo the terrible sufferings, sufferings of the past few hours in order to run after a careless husband. It's a case of the blind leading the lame, is it not? But Armand... Oh, have no fear for Armand! I, did I not pledge you my word that he would be safe? He and De Tournay and the others are even now safe in Agent Arrow's carriage. That, well, that is my carriage for now. But how? No, there's so... There's so much that I don't understand. Oh, well, it is really quite simple from my end of things, but I... God, that must have been a damned puzzle for you. Where to begin? First of all, I was, I was fortunate to meet Sir Andrew just after I left La Chagrie, and he told me of your daring mission. I could hardly go back to the inn, knowing that uh, Chevelin had summoned the city guard to capture me, but I knew now that the plans had changed. My true identity had been discovered, and... I needed you to join Armand de Tonnet and me all in one place so we could all get home together. So you invented this Agent Erro? Oh no, Agent Erro, unfortunately, is very real indeed. We'd met before. The real Erro really did find me and he did his best to arrest me, but nat I naturally would have none of that nonsense. I'm afraid I had to whack him on the head and take his things. Ugh. Damned uncomfortable things, Jules. Damaged my second best cravat. Unfortunately for me, uh, Chavalon had never met the real Agent Arrow in person, and the darkness of night and his bandaged face and unfashionable get-up did the rest of the work. But how did Armand escape the hut in time? <laughs> well, that's just the thing. I insisted that I enter the hut first, remember? I parked Agent Arrow's carriage at the back of the hut in order to pursue his escapees, you recall, walked into the hut and warned the men to scamper out the back and directly into the carriage. Then I dropped the false note on the floor to misdirect Chavalin, knowing he would want to search the hut after me. But you had two armed guards watching the carriage. Yes. Lord Tony Dewhurst and George Hastings do look quite fetching in their French uniforms, do they not? Ain't that right, Tony? But it really was that simple. Oh, I found that doing the impossible is often deceptively simple. Any plan so audacious, so transparent that any idiot would see through it, those are precisely the plans my adversaries fall for time and time again, because they're, they're looking for something complex. They expect the Scarlet Pimpernel to be inhuman, a figure of boundless wit and impossible strength. They aren't looking for the old pepper in the snuff box trick. <laughs> I still can hardly believe how little I knew of who you really are. 
you're clever and brave and selfless and you're willing to conceal all the best parts of your character from the world to keep your secret. What's next? Are you going to tell me that you're also Mr. Jellyband, Madame de Tournay and George III himself? How were you able to hide behind the mask of a silly fop for so long? Oh, don't fall prey to the same trap as the rest of them, my dear. I merely played the part of, of who everyone already thought I was. Frivolous, vain, useless. All the things I was until the reign of terror maybe changed that. Oh, there may be more to me than meets the eye, but I think at heart I really am a silly fop. One can't possibly become a master of disguise without knowing a thing or two about fashion. And I believe death-defying adventures would be nearly intolerable without a sense of humor. Mm. Besides, isn't it more humiliating for these sullen French agents to be defeated by ridiculous disguises, childish pranks, and the camaraderie of a bunch of old school chums? I swore from the day I started this mission that I would save lives without taking any. And my men and I have held ourselves to it. What about the real Agent Carroll? Oh, uh, he'll be perfectly fine. I, I was, he was already stirring when I left him, but I'm, I'm sure he's in a towering temper. You, you see, I, I tied him up and locked him in a chicken coop, stripped down to his underclothes. And I left a note with him too, featuring a, a little poem of my own composition. I believe it is my second best ever. Let us hope that it is better than your, they seek him here, they seek him there, rhyme. Oh, on the contrary, I think they went something like this. I seek him here, I seek him there, I seek him in my underwear. If you should find me and notice the smell, then think the Scarlet Pimpernel. You really are silly at times, aren't you? Thank you, my dear. And now let us Go meet with Sir Andrew, who I'm sure is waiting most impatiently at the coast. Sink me, you had forgotten him, hadn't you? I've been so worried about you, he completely slipped my mind. Oh, that is a compliment indeed to be remembered over a handsome gentleman like Sir Andrew. As I said, I met him just after I had that very interesting supper party with my friend Chevlon. Odds fit have a fish have a score to settle with that young retrobate. But in the meantime, I told him of a roundabout route to take the daydream that bring him here unsuspected just about the time when we are ready for him. And he obeyed? Without question. He's a good lad, isn't he? Ah, see, he comes now. I told you he'd be most impatient. Percy? Percy, are you there? Uh, here I am, my friend, all alive. Though I do look a damn scared. Scarecrow. Oh. I was beginning to worry that something had gone wrong. I'm sure Armand and the Comte de Tournay and friends are all quite cramped in that little carriage. Oh, my apologies, Sir Andrew. I'm afraid I was utterly distracted by the charming company. Mm. Now, my friend, I have not yet had time to ask you, what are you were doing in France when I ordered you to remain in London? Insubordination, what? If would you have had me allow Lady Blakeney to make the journey alone? Lord love me, you're quite right. But now here we are, we must lose no more time. That brute Chavlan may send someone to look after us when he realizes we deceived him yet again. Daydream awaits us. Yes. Down the cliffs, but I can barely walk, let alone climb, Percy. Chavlan and his men are sorely lacking in gallantry, I fear. I will carry you, dear. The blind leading the lame, you know. Both of you can take your rest as soon as we get on board. And I will play the pilot. When we, are, when we are all safely back in England, and I will finally feel that Suzanne's eyes will not greet me with reproachful looks, then it will be my turn to rest. Half an hour later, they were on board the Daydream and reunited with Armand, the Comte de Tournay, and his friends. But exhausted though the Blakeneys were, they found themselves unable to sleep just yet. Percy, how many things will be different when we get home? They already are, my dear. He just called England home. You well, never really did feel like it was your home before, did you? 
confess that I felt a bit homeless at times. I no longer recognized France as my home, but Blakeney Manor still felt so... Cold, grand, impersonal. You know, I've always felt the same. It's a beautiful old pile, isn't it? But lonely. I was a lonely child there for so many years, reading the tales of adventure to my invalid mother and dreaming of a bigger world out there. Then I suddenly found myself the master of a state at five and twenty, all alone in that big empty house. You know, there are so many rooms. I was hoping... Perhaps it's foolish. No, go on. Perhaps we could turn Blakeney Manor into a home for refugees from France. To give them uh, somewhere friendly to stay after we bring them over. Not, not just nobles, but, but artists. Intellectuals, clergymen, courtesans, orphans, anyone who no longer feels safe in France. Zooks, the manor is remote enough from, from London that nobody will notice a few old folks coming and going. There's plenty of room at the dinner table and we hardly ever have company. You know, I was hoping to do this before I met you, but then everything changed and I couldn't exactly bring my, my work home. Percy, I, I think it's a marvelous idea. Really, I do. We don't need so much space for just the two of us. There's just one problem. What's that? If we should become too overrun with company, we may finally have to begin sharing a bedroom. Mm. My dear, I'd be honored to share everything with you. The rest is silence. Silence and joy for those who had endured so much suffering, yet found at last a great and lasting happiness. But it is on record that at the brilliant wedding of Sir Andrew Fox and Mademoiselle Suzanne de Tournay, the most beautiful woman there was unquestionably Lady Blakeney, whilst the clothes Sir Percy Blakeney wore were the talk of London for many days. It is also a fact that Agent Chauvelin was not present at that or any other social function in London after that memorable evening at Lord Grenville's ball. The Committee of Public Safety, in fact, was so enraged by Chauvelin's failure to capture the Scarlet Pimpernel that he was demoted to desk duty for the foreseeable future. The Scarlet Pimpernel, however, continu continued to put in appearances in France for a few years to come accompanied by an ever-growing band of followers, including, some say, a woman. Although, curiously, these missions became fewer and further between after the birth of Sir Percy Blakeney's eldest son, Armand. Nearly forgotten by time, the true identity of the Scarlet Pimpernel was never revealed. Until today.
And I'm sorry, I, I, I got stuck in my cravat. Let's go back a little. Um, but that's just such a great problem to have. 